Trady Nut, episode 129. Everyone can learn technicals, right? Everybody wants to understand, you know, technical analysis. The reality is 90-10. We know that it's nine. We could even go higher, but let's say 90% psychology, 10% technicals. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax, learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host Cam Hawkins and today we've got Mark Hutchinson on the show. Now, Mark is from Falcon FX who have trained up many, many YouTube uh, Forex celebrities. So I'm hoping to get some of those on the show in the future. Um, but in this interview, it's not just a normal interview. It's an epic, epic interview. You've got to probably listen to this a few times through. And also there's a some amazing book recommendations which I hadn't had on the show. I think I might have actually had one of these books on the show once before. This time I listened to them before recording this today, and I've got to say, they are epic, especially for not just your trading mindset, but also your general mindset as a whole, and even just your general lifestyle and how you how you decide to live your life. So guys, that's coming up. Those book re- recommendations are awesome. Um, talking about something else that's awesome, we've got Scalper versus Scalper. I've decided this is going to happen. Uh, so this is my scalping live scalping market challenge. So guys... In what format, you've got to stay tuned. But if you do want to take part in it, uh, then head over to tradingnut.com, find the link to the challenges page, fill in the form there where you can apply to be a Scalper vs. Scalper contestant, and we'll see if we can get you on in the future. Uh, talking about other things going on over there, whilst you're there, check out the robot section where I've got my Robot Builders Club. It's, the doors are still open at the moment, if you do want to come on board, this is a great time to come on board. I've just released a robot to my members this week, which is an M and W pattern robot. Okay, so it trades the M and W pattern. You're going to see how I do that. I'm going to put a video up on the YouTube channel soon, so you'll actually see how that uh, robot works. But yeah, you can learn to, learn to build these things, fully or semi-automated trading robots, whatever you can dream up. I teach you how to do that without any coding at all. So guys, if you do want to come on board, now is the chance while the doors are still open. All right, that's enough from me. Let's get on with the show today with Mark. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy it. Let's do it. Whether you're a struggling trader or a profitable trader, our sponsor, City Traders Imperium, are offering you the chance to become a fully backed Forex trader. That's right, get coached and funded with CTI today. All right, folks, here we are on Trading Up. We've got Mark Hutchinson in the house here, all the way from Falcon, Falcon FX in the UK. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much, Cam. Really excited to jump on here. Yeah, well, look, great great to have you on. I know we've we tried to do this a couple of times, and we finally got here. Um, I've been watching some of your content. I really, I, I really like what you're putting out there in terms of some of the motivational stuff. Um, and I've, I've had a, I've got some questions around some of the books that you're reading as well, and want to get into that in the show. Um, but to start off with, to get the guys to understand how you got to where you are now, do you want to tell us your trading story? Yeah, sure. So I actually started off in 2008. So I hit it with the, when the crash happened, as you know, and I've originally started with stocks. So my first kind of intro into the market was I was made redundant as an engineer because like my family's very like, uh, be a doctor, be an engineer, that kind of path, that sort of route, very um, business based as well. And then after I got made redundant, you know, it, that kind of hit me deep. So I had a small amount of savings and I saw one of these kind of seminars. So back then in 2008, these kind of two day, three day intensive courses, they were super popular, but it wasn't what it is now, what you see on social media. It was more so business professional, uh, someone who's been in real estate for a while, ex banker, et cetera. It was more that sort of demographic where I just thought, you know what, I'm going to put myself amongst it. So I invested the savings that I had. It was like two, three K done the two, three day course majorly felt out of my element as you can imagine there's like 40 people in a room i'm this 18 year old looking around everyone's like 40 plus i'm like should i actually be here uh so th- that was uh that was my first kind of inroads into that done well out of fluke i think anyway you know you can just hit a good run quite easily when the market does well you know pick some stocks you count grows and then unfortunately my broker went into liquidation 
So for those who know the story of MF Global, right? MF Global in New York went into liquidation. I remember it like it was yesterday. My brother called me up and he was like, have you got your funds out of MF Global? And I was like, why is that? And then I looked on the news and they was going into liquidation. So before I could even get any funds out, like it was no chance, like you're, you're not getting into the account. So that was almost the, the bad taste in my mouth where you almost now have this fear that if you put any money into an account again, what's going to happen? And of course, with stocks, you've got things double listed, you've got more gaps, all of those types of things and mergers happening. So there's so many things. And I realized, wow, I'm so early on to this. I don't know enough. And then that was when I naturally transitioned into foreign exchange, more liquid, et cetera, more predictable. And then I realized what I had learned in stocks, I could just apply it to Forex. So that I started getting into Forex, applying what I did. My, my kind of style back then was support and resistance, EMAs, Fibonacci, all the kind of like basic stuff. And then pattern identification was kind of blended in within that. So I just thought rather than going on like another Forex course, for example, or just like going from course to course and learning something else, why don't I just apply what I've learned here and just see if it works? And it did. There was a few variations, but the same sort of thing, like patterns have played out, similar stuff. And then I just kept literally chugging away at it for quite a few years. And after four years, I finally broke through through like ups and downs. Like I'm sure a lot of people listening will resonate with that. You know, you feel like you've gone 10 steps ahead and you're back to the drawing board where the market humbles you in seconds. You have like a winning streak for 10, 10 wins and suddenly you're in a losing streak again. So that kind of took me to that point of breaking through to consistency. And and if you had to sort of, uh, if I, I suppose, identify a, a point where you did break through, when you look back now, is, is there anything that happened or was it just not having that losing streak? I, I think it's just, uh, this is, it's a good point that you mentioned, Cam, because I think everyone's searching for that. It's like, what's that one pivotal moment? But the, the reality is things click in a new unit of time, right? So where wherever you are consciously at the moment you're in a different consciousness in a different unit of time so sometimes you've just got to do the same thing and then suddenly it will click i'm sure everyone resonates where you're learning something and then just one moment it just clicks i'll give you an example i'm a musician as well right and music helped me massively so i remember when i was first learning to play a song i'd be playing the song on a guitar and my, it, it's hard for your fingers right because your fingers are trying to learn where to be on the fretboard etc and you just play it and play it and play it for hours and hours and then just in one moment you just play it flawlessly and you almost have this really it's just it's just i can play it now it's like what changed absolutely nothing just the hours and hours and hours that you've put in so sometimes it's just you've now absorbed this subconsciously and your mind has actually seen these variations like for example the subconscious mind we're operating on a subconscious level so when you're trading in the markets, let's say you're looking at a particular structure or a pattern, your mind might need to see that 10 to 15 times in the, in the same type of variation for it to accept, I know it now, I'm unconsciously competent at it. And I think that's the part that this space is missing. It's always searching for what's that one tip that I can do? What's the three things that's going to, none of that. You just got to be patient enough to break through. But if I could kind of go back to pivotal things, it was definitely psychological. So I had a, a deep attachment to the monetary value of everything purely just because coming from humble beginnings, you tend to latch onto things that you don't have. Right. So I always used to look at, let's say if I put the short tool on, I would look at Aussie dollar and then I would go, right, if I'm in there and then that, and I get out there, that's, that's 1100, 1100 pounds. That's 2k. So I, I would associate so much emotion with if I'm in there, I've made that. And then I would fantasize over getting that. So the, the moment that I detached myself away from that, I was like, now I can actually trade from a system and not most Hey, just jumping in here with a message from my sponsor, Sage Strategies. Do you want to trade gold and crypto like the institutions? Well, now you can, and it's free for 14 days with Sage Strategies, fully automated trading strategies. Check out their live track records for 25 unique strategies, plus they'll host everything for you, which is perfect for beginners and advanced traders or investors. Simply sign up for the 14-day free trial at sagestrategies.io and experience it for yourself. Yeah, I I, I, I agree with that completely. Like in, in terms of putting a take profit in and seeing how much the your take profit would be if it gets hit. Yes. It yeah, completely yeah. almost, you start to make, make up stories around it. Like, oh, yeah. what's the point? It's not even enough. It's, it, what's, you know, the trade's not even worth it. Or, exactly. you know, and it's like, and then you take the trade anyway and get stopped out. And it's like, all of a sudden you got emotions on the, <laughs> on the stop out. So, um, now, 
before we get into the sort of trading uh, minutia, Safeway story. Do you have a Safeway story you can share? Something that happened at Safeway that I I heard you mention it in some something and yeah. related to your trading journey. And for yeah, those who yeah, don't know what yeah. Safeway is, it's a super, uh, old supermarket in the UK. Yeah, so uh, that that brings back a lot of emotions. So when I was younger, right, so we, we got hit with um, unfortunate events, right? You get dealt a bad hand. So my dad had an accident and he had um, a stroke. So he's paralyzed in the right side of his body. So we kind of went from living, I wouldn't say middle class, but just like, okay, like we're not struggling for money, but we're not wealthy. And then when we got hit with that, like everything bad that you can imagine happened, happened. So then we was living from like benefits, like literally 10 pounds a week or sometimes less than that. And I remember this time where I was like four or five years old. So I'm like, not really like aware, like you don't really remember these events. So my sister always like played it back to me. We was in Safeways and we would buy all these groceries, like everything that we could. And if anything came over 10 pounds, we'd have to put stuff back. So imagine being in a queue. It's like humiliating. It's embarrassing. You're in a queue. It's my mum, my sister and me. Yeah. And then I'm just watching my mum. And from vaguely from what I can remember, my sister remembers, she's a little bit older. She can remember very clearly and telling me the story that she's just putting stuff back. And I'm like, what? We had to put stuff back. Yeah, they would literally count it and then we'd put stuff back and it wouldn't be the right amount. And then the, the cashier lady is telling us, no, it's still like £10.27. And then we've got to put another can of beans back. Oh, wow. And when I got told that later on in life, like enough, enough. And I just thought, do you know what? F this. Like, I'm not, I'm not having it. Like, I'm not having it. I'm now, that gave me so much fire. And this is where traders are often, often focusing on the how. It's like, how can I trade six figures? How can I get this? How can I get that? And they don't focus on the why. They don't focus on, well, why do you want that in the first place? And the people that have the why, the clear, clear why, those are the ones that go far. I had that why there and then. Like, if you're going to ask me for a shift, it was there. I was just like, no, nah, it's not happening. I'm not, we're not doing this anymore. Like I'm going to be the one that gets us out of this kind of area. Like not the nicest area. I'm going to get us out of it. And I'm grateful today that it's been achieved. So I'm actually building my parents, their dream home right now. Awesome. It's going to be done in like, like three weeks on, on our grounds. So we've got quite a lot of land here. Um, and that, that was the why that was it. So like, you know, sometimes you have to dig deep within something that hits you in a different way that gives you a motivation that no one can stop you. So the nights when you're tired, the nights when you want to go back to the draw, you have to go back to the drawing board. You can do that on a Friday night when everyone's going out partying, you can stay there for six hours, not talk to anyone and just crack on with it. And most people don't have enough of that drive and they just want it. They just want it now, now, now. And they don't realize these things take time. It's interesting. So a lot of, a lot of the guys come on the show and, and they talk about what drove them but they don't give it a name and i think that's what you've done here today is give it a name it's what's your why why are you doing this guys that's a a big driving or motivating factor that's going to help get you through all the Mm -hmm. tough times and the times you're thinking about giving up so um, that's the takeaway for everyone out there listening or watching now um next question is really sort of how did you get from your stock and moving to stocks from from stocks to forex using the same stuff things seem to start working did you did you have to adapt anything or change anything or was it literally like that guitar playing um kind of theory in terms of you've seen it so many times that now you can you're finding the ones that don't work and the ones that do work yeah it was it was it was more so from a perspective of stripping things back and testing right so i realized i had a whole lot of junk you know, I had so many indicators, everything on. And the the big thing for me was the testing stage was reverse engineering. So I would take a bunch of trades. Again, I wasn't afraid to lose. Right, right now, everybody getting into trading, they just want their returns to go well straight away. They don't realize that you have to have skin in the game. You have to have capital that you're willing to lose. And that is your almost building blocks. So I understood that. I accepted that. So what I would do is I would take loads of trades. I'd reverse engineer. I'd ASR. So for those that don't know, advanced self-review. I'd review my positions and see, forget about the losers because they're minimal. I stick to 1% per trade. Let's look at the winners. And I would start to notice that all of these winners, I keep capping them short, right? So I might make a three to one, four to one, and they would go on for like eight, 10, 12, sometimes 20%. So what's happening here? And then I started to notice a correlation of a pattern is that I'm putting too much importance 
on certain things like support resistance because I'm remember I'm trading patterns throughout that so I slowly started to strip it back like right I don't need that 200 EMA I don't need the 100 EMA I don't need that fib like so I'm not saying it doesn't work it just it wasn't resonating with me so I kept stripping it all back till I got to just pretty much naked price action and then I've got patterns I'm like well all of my good trades come from these patterns so why do I need anything else why do I need anything else to influence it when I can just I'm taking it based off the pattern anyway all this other stuff is just I mean, I don't know any different. So I've, I've learned all these things. So I think, well, they must be important, but they weren't resonating with me. So then I just stripped it all back. I said, let me just try this for a little bit. And then I slowly started to tweak it, tweak my entries a little bit, look at where I would take profit. So it was really clear. And I actually found it so simple because I didn't have all this mess. I mean, some people can kind of decipher through that and use it to their advantage here and there. But for me, I was like, simply, I'd rather not bank an extra two percent on something else if it would help me in that one moment and i would accept that and just trade what i see and what what type do i mean from a time time frame point of view you've obviously got you know all the time frames you can find under the sun yeah, yeah. but what ones did you focus on and how did you find those to be the ones that you wanted to trade so daily daily is a very important time frame for me for direction etc but i kind of work my way down like i used to look at the monthly weekly daily all the way through i mean the monthly is important right because you can identify where people like the banks etc are looking to hold their positions however for me that takes a long time to play out so you don't necessarily need to know that i mean once a month i'll look at the monthly but i don't need to look at it all the time Weekly, daily, daily is a very important time frame, four hour, one hour, and then 15 minute. So 15 minute, look, the kind of more experience that I've gathered is the smaller the time frames that I've gone. But really and truly, if I was to say my, my most important time frames would be daily and one hour. Like I love those two time frames because they paint such a clear picture for what we do. And that's actually all you need because you can look at it. Sometimes if something's not that clear on the one hour, you can go to the four hours, a bit of confirmation as to, yes, that makes sense. And then I'll go back down to the one hour to then confirm the idea that I already had. So it was just a matter of testing. And, you know, you test the 30 minute, you test the two hour, the eight hour. You're looking at all these things and thinking, don't need that. Don't need that. That's good. That's good. And I just kept it simple with those time frames. And are you treating the market as fractal in terms of what you're looking for on the higher time frame? You're looking for the same kind of pattern on the lower time frame? Yeah, yeah. So there's a uh, certain degrees within degrees. So I have a, a holistic view on patterns, right? So when most people ask, I say, right, so how do you trade? Oh, you trade with patterns. And in the head, they kind of go to the the typical ascending channel, descending channel, you know, just basic head and shoulders, which we, we do trade those patterns, but we don't trade them the same way as what you see on like an infographic, right? So what I kind of dug into is that it's not just patterns, there's actually patterns within patterns. So we could all agree and correlate that an ascending channel looks exactly like an ascending channel. Yet I could argue one is terrible, right? And garbage. And one is one that actually gives you something right. And I can show that on the charts. It's very easy to see once you know what you're looking for. So I kept digging deeper into that. And I thought it looks exactly the same in terms of if you zoom out, you're like, right, that's a channel. That's a channel. Yeah. But that one's completely different. That's noise and nonsense. And it's not going to provide you anything. And that one has clear structure and direction, something you can kind of decipher to get involved in and that's where my kind of love for things like elliott wave came in now i'm not an elliott wave trader by any means but i do follow wave principle in the terms of impulse correction impulse correction that's really the base bones of our strategy as the way that the market flows and then what we do is that we essentially identify high value areas where banks hedge funds etc institutions are getting into the market and then we're in accordance to that so we're catching those moves when they're in. Now, we're not necessarily going to be uh, right at the pinpoint of the sniper of like a three pip stop. Well, that's fine. We accept that. That's not what I'm after. What I'm after that resonates with us is sustainability. So we might not get 50% a month, but that's okay. You know, we're, we're happy with, with, with what we've got because it's sustainable, easy to look at, and something that's very consistent. And back in the day, I mean, with in terms of your your account growth, so you had the the uh, MF Global capital locked away. I don't know how, how long that was locked away for, but um, did you have to did you have to try and be creative about how you scaled your account, or was it all natural, or, or how did you go about approaching that? Yeah, it was uh, it was difficult because after I think it was three years they took. So I scaled my account from like not much to ten k, right? Which back then, when you don't come from much, ten k is a lot of money. And then eventually they gave us 1,600 
uh, 1600 back. And this was like after years, I was like, well, that's not important to me anymore. I could have done with that straight away, <laughs> you know, but uh, so it took me a few years. So then I just done every job that I could. I was literally working so many different jobs just to deposit money into my trading account. I mean, I was collecting glasses in a nightclub. I was doing anything you can name it. I just decided that I am not going to, I almost felt like if I go down the normal route of a job, right, I've almost accepted defeat that I have to, because I'll get comfortable. I'll get comfortable that there's a pathway here. I can get promotion. I was like, no, I'm going to do the most awful things that I don't want to do. And I know I don't want to be there. And all I'm going to focus on is how much wealth can I acquire? How much money can I get for, for doing those jobs or whatever it is? Stack it, stack it, stack it. I'm not going to buy Gucci belts. I'm not interested in that. I'm just going to keep on growing my account till I'm in a position that, that actually does something. Because back then, things like what you see prop firms, Cam, they didn't exist. Or not that I know. So you couldn't get anything that way. It was yeah. like, you either have money or you know someone that does that's willing to give it to you. So yeah, have to be uh, creative. It, and so, so, I mean, I'm interested to sort of find out why you decided that, like, you know, you sound like, I don't know if you're a qualified engineer, but you sound like your engineering was something you obviously knew how to do. Um, yes. You decided you wanted to go and get these crappy jobs, collecting glasses and bars. What put you in the mindset of, hey, like I'm, I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be one of these guys that does the nine to five stuff. I'm gonna be one of these guys that goes out and actually does something fantastic with their lives. What? Because I mean, that is, as a young guy, it seems. I think it actually seems to be more happening more often than not. Simply because of the internet, it didn't wasn't really around when I was growing up. But what was what was the cl- uh, clincher for you? So it was just for me like finding a lot of comfort in discomfort. So I would, I would find things that make me uncomfortable and there's just make sure that I've got enough drive then to do that. So people are fueled by different things. People are fueled by the desire to the fear of loss, right? Or the desire for gain. So I think do whatever serves you. Like I'm not a big fan of people carrying a chip around their shoulder thinking, you know, the world owes them everything mm. or like, oh, you need to prove people wrong. You know, everybody's like they're fixated on something. Like I need to prove people wrong. I don't think that's healthy longer term. However, do what like make do with whatever you've got so if you do have a chip on your shoulder right now and that's getting you out of bed good crack on with it right you'll eventually realize after a while after a few years of getting success that you don't need to prove anyone wrong and you're in your own lane it's just yourself right but use whatever you can to get you out of bed and get done what you need to get done so for me what was pushing me to do that was just being amongst these environments i know i hated I couldn't, couldn't stand the thing that oh, I've got to do this forever. It was like the fear of being average was so strong. That it was like, just keep building money, keep building money. Cause it was keeping my dream alive that I, it's not like I was making money and then just like, yeah, I'm just going to do these terrible jobs till I get motivated. It was, I'm going to do these jobs and I'm going to put that money into an account that's useful. So I knew there was a, an association to do with what I was doing, whether it was washing cars, collecting glasses. I was doing night shift at one point, carrying plasterboards. I mean, my fingers still hurt from carrying these plasterboards up and down stairs all day. But again, use use your pain for fuel. Yeah, awesome. Um, now, jumping back into trading. So if you had to break your trading down into some uh, stats, I mean, how many trades are you taking in a week? Uh, a week, it, it really does average between when the market is active from the way that we trade. So my average, I would say, is probably about two per week, right? When the market's hot, when it's uh, even more active with the way that we trade. I mean, we could go up to 15 a month, but it's not really done on the weekly basis. I mean, I could go a whole week without taking a trade. And then the next week I've taken a trade on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? And then one week I might have taken just one trade and then four trades. So averages out about eight to 10. That's my sweet spot anyway. I don't really tend to go anything over that unless we're in like a full bull run. So if you remember like 2014, 15, when Euro dollar just keeps selling off and selling off, I mean, well, naturally I'm going to be more active. So my kind of style is know when to be active and when not to be active, know when to preserve your capital. So when the, I almost see it as like with the way that we trade, when the conditions give us permission, it's like, I can see that now. That makes sense. So I'll naturally take a higher frequency of trades. And when I can see we're in consolidation periods, I'll take a step back and I'll protect my capital because that's more important than, you know, an extra few trades here and there. And out of 10 of those trades, how many are you winning? Around 70%. Okay. So, cool. yeah. So not the highest strike rate in the world, but not the lowest strike rate, but really and truly, you don't need a ridiculously high strike rate to actually make money. So this is a point that people need to, 
uh, really get to grips with. I mean, you could have technically a 30 or 40% strike rate, but still technically win. However, you have to ask yourself emotionally and sustainably what are you willing to go through? So for example, let's say you take 10 trades and your strike rate was like 20%, but 20% actually made you more than the losses that you took. Now that might work on $1,000. It might work on 10K or even 20K. It's not going to work on 100K. It's not going to work on 200K. So the goal is then if you're doing something right now that is doing well for you and you're willing to you know, take $100 loss, $100 loss, and you're willing to take like seven or eight of them. So when you do win, you make like 2K. You're like, yeah, I'm winning. My strike rate's really low, but I'm still winning. Yeah, but when you've got 10K a position on the line, then how do you feel? Yeah, so yeah. you've almost guaranteed no scale. You're like, yeah, yeah. You're, you're in a bubble now of like you can only trade 20K and you wonder why you're scratching your head, why you've, you've not progressed. It's because you've built unsustainability. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of doing things that is going to be sustainable at higher amounts because surely that's the goal of any trader. You, you want your time back, right? So you want to be able to click the mouse, fill the deal ticket out, and that be worth more and you have more time. Yeah, fit, true. And it, it's funny because that's the first time somebody's mentioned the fact that those, like I suppose, low win rate, um, high reward trading strategies where they might fall down is when you've got a higher, higher account balance. A trick for new players. Yeah. Right, now, um, what about like instruments in terms of the markets that you're trading? How many markets are you trading? What are those markets? Yeah, so we do, well, we actually do quite a few markets. So we do commodities as well, so gold, oil, et cetera. Um, not massively in commodities, but when they're there, they're there. Indices, like for example, I took a position on the DAX recently on a short that was profitable. Um, the DAX I really do like, NAS 100, S&P 500, US 30. So we'll trade those, but predominantly what we trade is foreign exchange. So we won't trade every single currency pair, and it's not because we can't. We don't tend to trade too many Swiss pairs, so we stick to a, a certain few, but I'll still go through them. I've, I'm a firm believer that any pair has its day, right? So if it could be Aussie Swiss. Like I, You're not going to see on my journal that I take Aussie Swiss, probably hardly ever. However, if Aussie Swiss is in a decent area, I'm not going to rule it out. It's just that we know what we will frequently take more of and what we won't. So I tend to trade things like pound dollar, Aussie dollar, Kiwi dollar. A lot of the yen pairs, we find a lot of success on the yen pairs. Like Kiwi yen right now I'm looking at, uh, Kiwi CAD for the long. Just, yeah, the, those type of currency pairs, that they work really well for us, very consistent. And, and so with all these pairs that you've got to analyze, what does your typical trading day look like? So we've got a routine, very uh, man of routine, as we all are creatures of habit. So mine is very much about the morning and the evening. Take care of your morning, take care of your evening, and it will take care of your day. So I kind of set myself up as those top three, right? I'm looking at what are the top three pairs that I want to have on watch for today. So in the morning when I wake up early London, I'm looking at the markets. I can kind of gauge from Asian session anyway. I'm a true night owl. So I'll be up uh, your morning time anyway, still looking at the market, seeing what's available. And I can kind of tell within what we do that it's probably about six to eight hours away. So it's probably going to move slowly through the Asian session and then line up for the London session. Mm -hmm. So then I can already gauge that I'm going to be looking at pound dollar, this trade, this trade, and then I'll just shape it up. And if it's ready, I will kind of trade that session. And then sometimes it's not ready. If it's not ready London, it will likely be ready early US. And if it's not ready then, it's not ready at all. So I can kind of gauge my day from that. And then everything else is like, if I have alerts on, if something miraculously gets there. But even then, if it's got there on my alert, it's probably got there too fast. So then I'm still not late to the party. So it's like everything is set up in a process that encourages me to win and make good trading decisions. So that's kind of how my, my day to day goes. And when you do get one of those alerts, how do you make sure you get to a chart where you can analyze it and make a decision? Well, I'm at home mostly, right? So I work from home. Um, okay. One second. Cool. Well, that, 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 I asked that question because I I'm often find I'll get an alert and I'll be like out and about or driving in the car. And by the time I get park up, I, I you know, I'm on my phone and then I, I've got to do something and then next minute I've like completely missed, I've forgotten I've got the alert. <laughs> Is there any, have you got yeah, any yeah. hacks so, in terms of getting around that sort of issue? Yeah. So it's uh, for us, it's about forecasting, right? So forecasting is uh, the key thing for us. So what we will do is that we will always map those things out beforehand. So we have a very, very good idea of how we're looking to get into the charts. So what we tend to do is let's say like, cause we trade patterns, right? We're looking at this happens, this happens, this happens. So we already know what it looks like. We've already got it shaped up. And then we're able to set those orders. So we don't need to be in that as a market order, 
right? So I don't technically need to be there to take the trade. When things shape up, I could set my entry and I might not get triggered for six hours. So we don't, we don't really find ourselves in those situations, which is what I love about the flexibility that I, I've been there and I've done the whole market order, be there, take the trade, et cetera. But what works for us really well is that nine times out of 10, we're already placing the trade and you might not be triggered in for like five hours. Sometimes I'll take a, a trade like after swap hours and I'll wake up in the morning, it's still not triggered in. I'm like, oh, it's not triggered in yet, you know, and I'll, I'll assess it then. And if I'm triggered in, I'm triggered in. So that kind of works for us is that setting those entry orders. I think way too many people that, and it's not just our strategy, they have a strategy as well that they could deploy a little bit of those orders for the market to trigger them in, but they're so eager to be active in the markets. They just, they just get involved. Yeah. And, and do you mainly take stop orders or limit orders? Uh, stop orders. Okay. Yeah, stop orders. Yeah, yeah, stop orders. So uh, for myself, mainly stop orders. And I've done the whole kind of, like, we could get away with different orders. We could get away with limit orders. We could get away with, you know, when price pulls to a certain area that we've already set something for a bit more precision. But then the way that we look at the markets, we're not, like, waiting for price to get to an area to tap into it and then go right we're waiting for something to already trigger us into the market so we're better suited to that and if we did set those different orders well then we can't assess it because it might have got there with a bit too much momentum and then that doesn't really fit our style so we almost have to have a view on it set the order if it triggers us in perfect if not we leave it alone and then you know like after eight to ten hours if it's still not triggered us in then just remove the order and then we just go again you know if something's not triggered us in by that long it's probably not going to play out in accordance to how we're looking at the markets. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Um, now, in the beginning, what do you think made you different from all the other retail traders that you've come across in your life, uh, from a mindset point of view? That you, might, you know, you've got guys in your groups and stuff that you would have seen. What do you think made you different than what you can see out there? It's mm. a good question. I would say mindset was probably a big thing. You know, like a goal setting and just making things clear everyone can learn technicals, right? Everybody wants to understand, you know, technical analysis. The reality is 90, 10. We know that it's nine. We could even go higher, but let's say 90% psychology, 10% technicals. Most people don't realize how much importance that is. They don't realize how important the mindset is. So I would say the biggest difference for me is that since 2008, I mean, I've been in this a long time. It's like 12 years. So I've been in this game for a period of time, but throughout that journey, I discovered goals. I mean, I've got my, got my journal right here. It does, does not leave me. I'm, I've been an avid gold seller for so many years. In 2012, that was when the real big shift happened, is that I would set so many of these goals, I made it real for me. So what I'm able to tap into is people's mindsets to realize that that's the very thing holding them back. Like, think about it. If it was just about technicals, then why would we not just get the most intelligent people and they would be the best traders? That we already know from the data, if that's true, go find the most intelligent people and they will be the best traders. Yet they're not. Why? Because trading's an art. Trading is, is much more than that. So you realize, well, if it's not the technicals, what is it? It's the mindset. So what makes us different is that I tap into deep parts of that, whether it be language. Like we have on average 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. 90% of those thoughts will be exactly the same the next day. I'll, I'll tell you a very brief story to kind of tie this in. So if People think that it's consistency. Consistency is the easy part. It's the maintenance and the inner work and the mindset that actually controls it. So we've had, I've come across various, various students that they will actually get consistent, right? They'll see like 7% a month on average for like six, seven months, like not a fluke. It's quite deliberate. You don't just get that by accident unless you're just, you happen to be super, super lucky, right? And then they give up or they have doubt. And you're wondering why, why has someone got doubt when they're doing well? Where's the fear of success, lack of self-esteem, lack of self-worth? I don't fully believe they're actually going to do it because they've not developed the mindset to do it. So I'm hyper granular on, on that. I can normally tell within five minutes when I have a conversation with a student where they're at, right? Because they're just, their unconscious is pouring out. The way they talk about the market, I'm frustrated. Um, oh, this trade went against me. You know, their emotional language is everywhere. They don't realize their association with the market is what's holding them back. It's not the technicals. Mm. Because if I go back and I'm like, Take a look at this entry. Do you agree with it? Yes, I do. Why didn't you take it? Oh, I hesitated. Why did you hesitate? Oh, because I took a loss before. It's all emotional. It's got nothing to do yeah. with technicals. Yeah. So we go so deep into the mindset. And I know not everybody wants to hear it. And it goes through one ear and out the other. They're like, yeah, but tell me about how you can uh, backtest this pet. It's, like, it's not important. 
what's important is that do you have the mindset that if I dump 100k into your account, can you emotionally deal with it? And if you can't, what are you doing? You know, like, so goals being clear, like one thing I always recommend, and for anybody listening, this will be a great hack for you all, which is a day in a life. You essentially, as a trader, if your ultimate goal is to be a full-time trader, you want to make that feel real before it's happened. So what I used to do is I used to book days off of work, go to the coffee shop, and then I would just be with my laptop, order a cappuccino, slice of carrot cake, and I would just be trading and thinking, well, this is my life now. You know, like I would be like so present with it. Most people, they want a Lamborghini and they just print out a picture on their chart and they think that, you know, on their wall and they think they're going to get it. Have you gone to the dealership? No. Have you test drive it? No. Do you know how much it costs? What's the breakdown? How much money do you need to make? You know, they're not, they're not tangible and practical with it. Yeah. So I kind of took that same approach into if you want to be a successful trader, then why not live it? Yeah. Why not live it so much a day in the life of a trader, your own version of whatever that looks like, right? Whatever you, trading style you trade and get so present with it that when you go back to work, you're, you're never again. It's like, now I need this every day. So you're, you're, it's your why and your mindset that is going to fuel you to go through the challenges that you have, not your strategy. It, lots of strategies work. Yes, there's some better than others and some that you might resonate with more. But ultimately, it's, it's who you are as a person that's going to get you there. Yeah, that's a great little hack. I won't ask the question about do you have a mindset hack because I think that's that's <laughs> superb. That is a great answer. Uh, probably the best one I've had. Uh, hey, so what about a retail trader? They're working a day job. Obviously, they could do that hack to, to as one of the steps. What other steps would you say go and do these things so they can get, a, get in a position so they could be that person that's you know, making 7% a month growing their account on a regular basis? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the most important thing you need to be doing is firstly have a vision for where you want to get, right? Be around good people. Keep your goals close to yourself. Very, very important. Have some sort of monthly deposit. Like most people, like they can make money by just not spending more, right? They, they're always thinking, again, it's always the how, right? See, they always focus on the how, not the why. How can I make more money? How about just change your spending habits? And then you'll have more money as a side effect of that, right? I wrote a book, I wrote a book called The Side Effect, right? Which is exactly on that right? Everything is a side effect of what we do, right? So if I was someone right now working nine to five, it's like leverage your nine to five, change your association as to what you're doing. Most people will say, but, oh, but Mark, what if I hate my nine to five? Well, how about this? If you hate your nine to five and you love trading, how about you're getting paid to learn how to trade? Imagine seeing it like that. You're now getting paid to learn how to trade. That's one of the biggest hacks because now when you're going into work, you're not dreading it and you're not hating it. You're seeing, well, if I make 2K a month from like whatever job you do or 3K a month, you're now seeing it as that, well, I'm getting paid to learn how to trade. All of this is just like me just going to work and then that's giving me my income right now to be able to deposit. So what I'd be doing 100% is taking a, a ratio of that. Let's say it's 10 or 20%. Have that as a monthly deposit straight into your trading account because then – you, the thing is about trading all subconscious you have to feel like you are actually doing it and not so many people want to fantasize cam they want to fantasize over the idea of becoming a successful trader but they're not actively doing it and something happens in your mind when you're like right i'm actually depositing 20 percent of my income into my trading account that's someone who's taking it seriously and your mind actually registers that that no you actually you no one who's doing that wouldn't be doing that right so people that take it serious would do that so deposit See your association with your trading as you're getting paid to learn how to trade. It's a big mental shift. Do you know how many people that have hated their job that when they've changed that, they've gone into work chirpy, happy, because they're like, I get it now. Like I'm getting paid to learn how to trade. Like inevitably, if I keep working, I will become successful at it. So that's what I'd focus on, guys. Like everybody's done it and just be really, really strict with your time and just leverage what you've got. If you have to take a trade in the toilet, then do it. Do what you got to do. Yeah. I do remember one one uh, guest came on and said that they would they would book a meeting room out for an hour a day and do all their journaling in that meeting room <laughs> while they're at work and they're like, well, I'm getting paid to do my journaling, so I'm going to do it every single day. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what the colleagues were doing, like, where where's he go every day for an hour? Um, Where is he? Got that chance? <laughs> yeah. All right. So thinking about a price chart, what about what would you say to a new trader? Like, would you? If they had to go away and look at a price chart and study it for a month, what would you say? Go and study these three things. A good question. Three things I would say, for, well, from how we trade, it's going to help any trader out anyway, even if they adapt their style at a later date. But continuation and reversal patterns. Keep it simple. Don't have too many, right? 
and then identify the high value areas of where that is. Because if you take, let's say, an ascending channel, I mean, on a lower degree of a four hour chart or a one hour chart, if you're too zoomed in, it's not valuable. It could be in no man's land, you know. So identify the third thing is that where is that? Where are these reversals? Where are these major continuations in the high value areas? So go and search on a price chart and you'll pick apart when you see huge runs of momentum, right, either to the upside or to the downside. Identify if you see reversals and continuations in these areas where it's likely where the funds, institutions, the banks, they're stepping into the market. And then that way, that avoids you zooming in. So then you're not only looking for these type of structures that flow with the market nicely of continuation and reversal, you're actually looking at the right areas where you want to be in the market to avoid, you know, like buying the highs and selling the lows where the amateurs are. You need to understand where are those value areas. That's going to save you so much time and headache. Now, I've already asked you and you've come up with some great answers for around trading psychology. Do you have any other mindset stuff that you can share with us today? Uh, I do indeed. So there's a few. I'll, I'll give a book first, right? So we're actually creating a, a, a psychology program right now. We've just released it to our internal community, which is going to be available to the wider market in about a month from now. Um, and that goes deep and deep into the psychology of essentially rewiring your mindset, which is called rewired, right? It's about first learning how are you wired, right? Because that's not your fault. Remember, from zero to seven years old, that's when we're the most malleable. That's where we learn the most. So whatever your upbringing is, like, is what it is. But when you become older and you're consciously aware of that, your job is to learn why do you respond the way that you do? Why do you have anxiety? Why do you emotionally get attached to money? Like that comes from how you was brought up. Right. So you learn how you're wired, then you unwire that stuff that doesn't serve you. And then you rewire the stuff that does serve you. So that's kind of my philosophy of the rewired formula, kind of in a nutshell. But a book, something tangible you can get straight away that's going to serve you, Chimp Paradox. Have you have you read the Chimp Paradox scam? No, I don't actually I had I had the question here to ask you about it anyway. Um and I think I, I think I know what it's about. But anyway, go on, please. I and I think I may have even started reading it. I can't remember. Uh, I did read something around chimps. Has it got something to do with like a social, um, like a a startup company? Uh, no, no. So it goes, oh. it's it's more about like your your mind being the chimp, right? Oh, your okay, mind, yeah, your, yeah. your emotional side of things, yeah. right? By Dr. Steve Peters, is like incredible, incredible person. So I highly recommend you go check that out. Most people, they're searching for trading in the zone. They think, right, as long as I ring trading in the zone and I read uh, Market Wizards, I'm done. That's my psychology finished. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have to learn how to manage your mind. So Chimp Paradox is a huge hack. It's like, what, $10? Like, go get it. Get the physical copy or like get it on Audible if you prefer listening and then just read that back to front. So I'm a big advocate of not reading a lot of books, but reading the same book over and over again. It's like, how well do you know the basics? Remember, mastery is not knowing everything. Mastery is not complication. Mastery is having a high level understanding of the basics. It's how well do you know the basics? It's like 90% psychology, 10% technicals. How well do you know the 10%? Awesome. Now, I was going to say, I actually, on the chimp paradox, because I was going to ask you a question about it today, and I did go for a run earlier today, and I was Mm -hmm. listening to a free, I think it was like a free sort of podcast or series. It's not a podcast. It's like a series on Audible from Darren Brown. Do you know the the, the guy, Darren Brown? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the sort of mentalist. And Mm -hmm. the second episode was all about, or maybe even the first episode, no, it was the first, it was about a chimp brain and a non-chimp brain. And yeah, the computer chimp, is, is that sort of what what the chimp paradox is about yeah there, there's probably elements like crossovers into that but yeah it's probably along the same sort of lines as to like your your chimp brain is your emotional side and you've got to almost like feed the chimp like give the chimp a banana in the sense that uh, i'll give you a, a prime example of how a trader could do it right now you want to back test for five hours that's probably quite daunting for most people where they're like they'll put everything off to do that because four hours five whatever the session is well, then how about you reward yourself? You know, you have to trick your emotional side uh, that will, will want you to be comfortable. So I could say like, uh, let's say you like sports. I trick my chimp every day, right? I watched the Europa League final last night, right? But I had so many things done with all my business projects to do. And I said, unless I do all these things, then you're not having that banana. Uh, like you're not having that reward of what that is. So we have to understand we're, we're always going to pras- procrastinate. So use it as a tool as a reward system if there's something you enjoy doing even if it is an hour of netflix 
right? I'm, I'm not going to say sit there and watch Netflix all day. There's nothing wrong with watching your program. What is wrong with how you prioritize it? So give your chimp a banana, whatever that, even if it's cycling, even if it's going to the gym, you can then feel good about that knowing that, right, I've done, duh, 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 I've done all of that. I've done my back testing session. Again, your association with your back testing session is going to feel good because you know at the end of it, you're watching sports or doing whatever you want to do. So yeah, that's that in sort of a nutshell. Uh, cool, cool. Some massive gems being dropped here, guys. Hope you're taking notes and you're going to listen to this again. Now we're going to jump into the quick fire round where most of these questions are quick answer, some aren't. Um, how long did it take you to go from trading newbie to consistently profitable? So just over four years. That was a, a quick one. What's your favorite entry setup? Uh, continuation at the end of a correction, uh, catching that impulsive phase when the, the banks step in. What strategies do you use to exit or manage trades? So I use structure. So I use uh, pattern identification. So I basically trail my stop in accordance to what the structure is. And then I can just keep that run going for as long as possible. Some will run for 5%. And the, the, the benefit of it is that you don't have to deal with majorly large pullbacks. So it's mechanical, it's, it's got an element of mechanical in it, but there is an element of the structure as well, using your initiative, right? If it was purely mechanical, there's times when I'm sure you've experienced it as well. Market jumps in, you, you jump into the market, impulsive candle hits, and then you're running seven or 8%. And there's nowhere really for you to manage your trade. So what do you do? Do you just like wait and leave it open? Well, what if you've got 50K on the table? Are you gonna let 50K draw all the way back to break even before it plays out? unlikely so you have to have like an element of your experience and initiative to say i'm going to use structure 98 percent of the time but in those moments if there is just a huge candle well then i'm going to lock in 50 percent of whatever that candle is so my kind of philosophy is use the structure trail your stop because you could be in a trade that you keep trailing and you're like wow i'm still in this trade it's like up 19 percent where if you would have just set all these profit targets because you think the market's going to reverse from there versus what actually the market's going to do well, then you cut yourself short, which was the original thing that broke me through to consistency in the first place. So that's what's all my style. Awesome. Now, what about, uh, I've already asked you, or you've told us, shared us a book. I mean, do you have any other books or resources that you can share? I mean, I know that you do recommend Eat That Frog on your uh, link. Is that, what, what's, what's you, that you, even about? You, yeah, you just you just took the words out of my mouth. I oh. was literally going to say, "Eat that cool. frog," and you go, "Eat awesome. that frog." <laughs> so yeah, eat, "Eat that frog" is "Eat that frog" in another book, "War of Art." They're going to be quite similar. You've probably heard of like the art of war, yeah. right? But "War of Art." Have you read "War of Art"? Have you heard of that? By no, Stephen I Pressfield? haven't. I haven't read it. No, I have no. I've seen it. So, though, so but eat, I'm, I'm looking so for books to read. Frog, so. eat, eat that frog and "War of Art" are kind of similar in that sense. That it's about procrastination. So it's like do do the ugliest thing, like so eat that frog, the ugliest thing, the most important thing you want to do that day in the morning. Like again, just kind of wrapping that up. Really quick to read. Both of them are. They're really thin books. You can get through them, but there's so many gems in there. So many key things of like how you can prioritize your day. Like eat that frog is is great for that. That's that's another one of those kind of chimp paradox, eat that frog I would put in that category that has helped with my trading mindset so much. So, yeah, eat that frog, guys. Check it out. Or War of Art is going to be kind of similar crossovers. Cool. Now, what about your preferred broker and trading platform? So, for me, FXEM and IG Index. I mean, I've used a, a whole bunch. We won't talk about MF Global because that will open too many wounds. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so IG Index, FXEM, Oanda is a fairly decent one as well. And then you've got ones like Pepperstone, et cetera. But for me, FXEM and IG Index has kind of been my staple even from the earlier days. <laughs> Hey, you ever wonder what broker I use? Well, I use Hanko Trade. It was a no-brainer because I was looking for a broker with good trading conditions and no restrictions on trading my strategies. But one of the main reasons was their raw ECN spread, which could challenge any other broker you're trading with. Learn more at hankotrade.com or click the link in the description. And uh, what about your worst ever trade? If you had to walk us through that, how did that play out? Oh, yeah, really uh, bring it open in the wounds now, Cam. Um, so... Uh, Dolly Yen, I would say. So, do but this was a mistake. This was this was a mistake for me. So, there's been trades where, like, I remember Pound Kiwi when I was meant to risk like 500 pound a trade when I had my 50k account, and then I would I was trying to keep the trade in. I kept moving my stop. I'm sure loads of you have done this, where you're like, oh, but it might turn around, and it's like three pips away. So I'll move it a little bit more, move it a little bit more, and then I was like, ended up getting out for 1400. I was like, sick in my stomach that one like really like taught me uh, stop messing around with this now like that was like one part but the part that i would say was the worst was dolly yen so 
I was trading contracts for the first time, right? I wasn't used to it because I was used to FXCM. And then when I started putting these contracts in, it was like, I shouldn't be making this mistake at this level, right? And then I took 25K loss in literally an hour. And it was like, it wasn't one of those slow burner ones as well, where you can kind of make a decision to like, you've made a mistake. I've filled it out wrong and I've risked more than what I should. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be doing this. It was like literally 15 minutes. I'm out. And I was like, why is my account down like this? And I was like, huh? And I kept scratching my head. I was like, I've done it right. I've done everything right, but I filled it out wrong. And you might be thinking, look, even people at a high level, they may not tell you about it, but they make mistakes. Everybody does. And that was my worst one. And uh, I should have lost around 5K at that time, but it was 25. And that was a real, that was a real dent in the emotions. Like I, I didn't trade for about three days after that because it just wobbled me like quite a lot because you just keep playing it over. It's like, oh, now I've got to make this amount to then claw that back. So that was a, a horrible feeling. But every ideally, and hopefully to all of you, that you don't make those mistakes, but you will make some. Just ideally, they're not that costly. So yeah, it, it taught, taught me a lot. But that is, a, is a, a reminder that this is not this is not just a game, guys. Like you, can, you can put yourself in a bad situation by just a lack of focus and a lack of error. And the funny thing is, I was doing that while I was busy. I was like in the supermarket. Uh, you know, I was, place, I was placing a trade. Like you think you know what you're doing because you've been doing it for so many years, but I was distracted. And, you know, and it might not have been the reason as to why that happened. That might just be pure coincidence. But you're often fine when the mistakes happen is that you're either not at your desktop, you're not focused, and you're just like, yeah, take that trade and you could miss something. So, yeah, Dolly Yen is uh, not, not a fan anymore. <laughs> now, um, last question of the show. If you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Stay in your own lane right? Really staying in your own lane and actually understand what that actually means. Like stop comparing yourself to other people. We're we're at an all time high where it's not going to get any better. TikTok, right? Like people got TikTok mindset, microwave society. It's instant, instant, instant. Amazon prime, you know, people can't help themselves. They, you know, they, they get a delivery. You order something from Amazon. It's it's not here. It's been uh, 12 hours or 24 hours. It's like, we want something so instant that what we're doing is that we are training our minds to want something so fast that the moment that challenge arises we get upset right don't set any timelines as well i'd even go more into this one is that the biggest thing do not set a timeline on your success as a trader it's not going to happen on your time it's not going to happen on your schedule you cannot decide that in a year from now you'll be a consistent trader you just can't all you can control is the work the processes the things that you do in the time that you put in and as a side effect you'll achieve your trading goals so you almost have to have this mindset that Listen, I don't care if this is going to take me three years, four years, five years. I'm going to keep on going until I succeed. And what you'll find is, Cam, that most of the people that have that mindset are the ones that succeed. The ones that come in with the mindset that when six months from now, I should be a a fairly decent trader. Wrong. You've already set yourself up for failure because subconscious, your mind knows six months is in. It's like, are you a successful trader yet? No, I'm not. Oh, now I'm now you feel that this sense of like frustration or like you feel like it's taking too long, like we sabotage ourselves by putting these timelines out there. So honestly, for everyone's listening, like go in with the right mindset. And if you're not willing to do that, then maybe you're not in the right business. Cool. Awesome. Well, look, um, before we wrap up, what's the best way for the guys to get hold of you? Um, Instagram, channel, um, YouTube. So for those that seen our channel, so Falcon FX. So just type in Falcon FX on YouTube and you can see us there. And we've got a bunch of free content there, that mindset stuff, technicals that is going to help you out or just IG, or just type us in. Awesome. Well, look, a big thank you to Mark for sharing with us today. Everything we've discussed here, along with all the links and probably all those books, will be in the show notes. To find them, simply search for Mark in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. All right, folks, so there we have an interview with Mark done and dusted. Now, we did shoot a video after the interview. So if you want to find out how he trades, head over to the YouTube channel, check that out. Uh, Also remember to download those books or get access to those books. So The Chimp Paradox and Eat That Frog, really recommend checking those out. Also Scalper vs Scalper, you can apply for that on tradingnut.com, challenges link in the top nav, and then find a button on the page to apply. And Robot Builders Club, the doors are still open if you do want to come on board before they shut. Now is the time to act. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Hope you have a great week, and we'll see you in the markets.